Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show... Finally, the big release from Fox. Chain silencing goes factory fresh. Sadly, we hear trust performance has gone the way of the dodo. Oh yes, and that's right, it's quiz time yet again. Okay, so straight into news, and the hottest news this week is that finally the new Fox 38 has been announced, alongside updates to the 36 and the 40, and also the DHX2 as well there, as well as the X2, so plenty of new things from Fox. So that's a few images on screen there just to whet your appetite. Now, let's start off with some of the differences that you're going to see visually on some of these forks. You might have spotted this round brace that you can see on the screen there. Now that was spotted on Greg Callahan's bikes and a few other pro bikes that have been around for a while. And Fox have not confirmed anything, although we have known for a while that there is a new fork, running with that 38 mm stanchion. So this is the 38 on the screen now. But at a glance, the 36, this is the 36. It looks very similar, doesn't it? So let's break them down and have a look at some of these new features on the forks. Of course, the 40 also shares that same look. It's across the board now. And we'll get to why they've done that. It's kind of quite interesting. So first up, they've got floating axles on the 36 and the 38. So have a look at, um, on screen now and you'll see the axle. Visually, at a glance, it looks the same, but it's got a floating sleeve on the middle. It's said that it's basically to clamp your fork uh, properly around the uh, the wheel axle so there's going to be no chance of any binding or over tightening or anything like that and it supposedly gives a slicker action on the fork as well because of the fact you can't get any binding of the legs moving around so in theory that's a really good thing and they basically wheeled that out on the 36 and it's also on that new 38. You can have the Cobalt system which still uses the floating axle except it lacks the cam lever and just has an allen bolt head on there instead so i actually prefer that it looks a little bit cleaner however if you're taking your wheel off constantly to put you and uh, maybe you put your bike in the back of a car something like that it's not going to be as good for you so there is options available for you now let's have a look at the 36 first so this is a 36 on screen now the 36 is available in 27.5 and 29 inch models uh, and the offsets on those are 37, 44 and 51 millimeter options there. So it can suit all different riders and different styles of bikes. Now there's also an optional mudguard. So the mudguard looks quite cool, fits on the back of the brace a little bit like the old Syncross model that were fitted on the Scott bikes, which I was always a big fan of. It looks really neat and tidy and it looked like it's supposed to be on the fork. So kind of an integral sort of bit of design there. Again, a few more shots of it here. So there's the factory Performance Elite, Performance and e-bike models. There's 150 to 160 mil travel. And there's a few little new features on which it shares along with the 38. We'll talk about that when we get to the 38 in a second. Okay, so moving on to this new fork. So you might have noticed I said the 36 is only available now with 150 to 160. That's because the 38 now takes over the bigger travel bracket from 160 up to 180. Uh, this is it on screen in the pistachio color. I'll tell you what, that is the new orange. That thing looks rude. Um, I know that Blake's desperate for one of these already. I hinted to him that this was coming the other day and he's like, oh my God, it's green, I must have one. Uh, he's, he's, he's weird with green, I tell you, he's addicted to it. But anyway, so here it is on screen. It's available in 27 half and 29. The same three offsets as you get on a 36. So that's 37, 44 and 51 millimeters. Of course, no one offset is right for you or right for any particular bike. That's why there are choices now. Um, it's a really cool feature to have that, and I think more brands are offering that. Uh, again, it's got the optional mudguard there. Um, I didn't say the prices of the 36 actually, so they're between 1,339 euros and 1,459. And the 38, interestingly, is between 1,259 and 1,589. So a slightly broader bracket, but a slightly cheaper entrance point. The same thing, they're available in factory performance, performance elite, and e-bike models. 160 to 180 mil travel. Uh, it's also got a much thicker crown on them. So it's a 58 mil crown, and it's also got an elliptical design steerer tube on the inside there for additional strength fore and aft uh, where it needs it. And it's not adding any weight where it doesn't need it. So a much smarter system. And that bigger crown on there reflects the additional strength and stiffness that the bigger travel forks and e-bike forks are really starting to require uh, without having that extra crown up top that you get on the Fox 40. So that actually says 30% stiffer in the transverse shear, 17% stiffer fore and aft, and get this, you're gonna love it, 
38% torsionally stiffer than the 36. So it's kind of apt that it's a 38 Mustang and it's 38% stiffer. Pretty good that. Now, the 38, in addition to the 36 and the 40, they all feature these bleed valves on them. So that is to basically restore the atmosphere, uh, basically you get atmosphere pressure build up in the forks and you can release them. Now you're not always going to get this when you go riding, not all forks need it and the chances are if you're just running a trail center you're never going to need to use this. However it does have this feature and it's great if you're riding really long rough extended descents you can get a pressure build up in those lower legs. Now we have said in the port uh, in the past there's a hack by using the blunt end of a cable tie you can just break the seal there and release that air. You don't need to, it is, you just push a button. Now you might notice if you look at them as well, there's a little channel running up above it. Uh, that's to additionally help that with the pressure, but also to help the oil um, that lubricates the low legs get to the seals and the foam wiper seals underneath. So they're gonna run slicker for longer. That has gotta be a good thing. So that is across the board on all the forks. Um, there's a few more shots. Now there's also the Heritage series. So these are the extremely limited ones. So that pistachio color in the 38 comes in Heritage. But I've got to say, the uh, the option for the 36 root beer, that is the one. I, I'm all over that. I think that looks amazing. Admittedly, the pistachio colour is a bit brighter. does look kind of cool and different. It's going to stand out. But the root beer one, that looks really classy. I'd love to build a bike with a sort of muted tones. So I think that looks really quite cool. Now, moving on to the 40. Um, by the way, the heritage colour in the 40, they call it Battleship. It looks kind of white in the images, but it's actually kind of a bit of a battleship gray. It's quite a light, cloudy gray color. It looks really, really quite classy. Actually a lot better in real life than it does in the images. Uh, so this is an all new chassis featuring that new arch, bleeders and channels and all that stuff. And the arch, finally, I'll pick it up on the 40, so I didn't mention it with the 38 and the 36. The arch is much, much stiffer, and they've built it in this way, so it actually clears the bigger head tube design. And the reason they're having to do this is you haven't been able to fit shorter offsets on certain frame designs because the head tubes are so big that the brace is risking striking the head tube under compression. So if redesign this arch, they actually stick out further out the front so you can run them basically you run whatever offset you want on whatever frame you want and the fork will be compatible. So that's a really smart feature. And of course, the end game is the fact it's stiffer. That is the ultimate thing. Now, I'm not sure about the look on it, and I've heard a few people say, oh, I don't really like the round look, I like the sort of the angular look, but I suspect it's just because it's a new thing. You look at the old one now, by comparison, it does look quite square. I mean, obviously it's quite square, but do you know what I mean? It grows on you after a while. I think we will start looking at its rounder brace and start thinking, actually, it does look a lot sleeker. Uh, but let us know in those comments what you think of those. Um, let us know which one do you like best, which colour do you like, you know, the root beer, pistachio, the battleship, um, and which model do you like, the 36, the 38, or the 40? Which one would you have if you could have any? Um, and now just an update on the X2 and the DHX2. This is both of those on the screen. Now, of course, the X2 is the one more applicable for most people. It's the Airshock one. It's an all-new chassis. It's got a new damper in there. It's got a new high-low main piston. It's got a new bottom-out bumper. It's a progressive bottom-out bumper as well. It's got matching eight click, high speed compression and uh, high speed rebound adjustment to suit the forks basically. So they're dialed in so you can pair them up on a bike and it's very balanced front and rear. So you do like 10 clicks, you'll have 10 clicks and it will feel basically the same. Uh, really good idea that. Uh, the high speed rebound has got the variable rate control valve on there. It's a super low friction air seal on there and there's also a smaller reservoir. This is on both the shocks, obviously uh, the same with the core sprung one. Uh, basically, so it fits more frames because obviously having a piggyback on a bike does mean there's gonna be limitations with certain size frames and frame orientations. Uh, really cool to see. And also one other feature on the coil sprung shock is it's got an indented uh, preload ring. So if you're running on minimal preload, sometimes they can rattle loose on longer runs. It won't happen now. Uh, really cool features from Fox Air. Okay, so this next one is fantastic. Straight out of Queenstown, we have VHS, Velocity Hucking System. Now this is a far more refined version of what a lot of people have kind of been doing at home. We saw it creep up in the World Cup pits maybe about a year ago or so. And it looks really, really cool. A silencing made, well, straight factory fresh, I'd say. Now it's 35 centimeters long in one packet. So you could do two different locations on the same bike, maybe the chain and the seat stay, or maybe you could take it over two bikes. It looks really cool and maybe one of the highlights is that it is accompanied by an awesome launch video with none other than Eddie Masters. Now these guys are really hucking their meat. The only thing is Eddie nearly has the lights stolen 
by that old Azonic Eliminator downhill bike, which could be said to be the star of the piece. Now, Ferris, who is a super cool guy and really passionate about his riding, is the person behind the scenes who started the company. So for the strip is gonna be 45 New Zealand dollars, or about 22 pounds, I guess, it's about half, and is available immediately. There might be some small delays due to Corona because let's face it, it is a hard environment to start a business in at the moment. Now we're gonna leave a link to the video in the description below. So let us know what you think. What catches your eye more? The Huckin, the Azonic Eliminator, Eddie Masters in what I can only assume is his you know, Sunday hangout clothes really. But also guys, if you've given it a crack, if you've tried to make a nice silencer on your bike with the slapper tape, with the mastic tape, whatever it is you use, then get in the comments below or maybe tag us on Instagram or use the upload link. There have been some really nice ones going about, but also, dare I say, some slightly less refined ones. We want to see them all. Get them uploaded. Yeah, thanks for that, Henry. Um, unfortunately, the next bit of news actually is a bit of bad news. Um, trust performance, well, trust has gone bust. Um, I'm really sad to say this. I know that a lot of people out there might have found the look of their forks visually a bit strange, but I personally loved what they were doing as a company. They were really sort of pioneering something. You know, the linkage fork thing has been visited in the past, but no one's really mastered it. And I thought they got as close as anyone could. Um, I'm, yeah, well, I am, I'm not quietly gutted. I'm gutted about it. Um, so here's some shots of the forks on screen. They turned up in 2015. By the time they got around to 2019, they sold a thousand pairs. And bear in mind, they're a couple of thousand euros-ish uh, for a pair, depending on which model you have. They had the Message, which is the 130mm one. This is it on my Canyon here. And they have the Shout, and that's got 178mm travel. They've got a slightly rearward and upward axle path. They call it the Contour System. Really quite in, like, it's ingenious, really. Um, three heavy hitters from the industry behind the company, including, of course, Dave Weagle, who's a bit of a suspension wizard, and he's had many, many good designs in the past, including the DW Link, which is still used by Pivot and still used by Ibis, probably to best effect of all the brands we've had in the past. Obviously, Sam Hill used to run the DW system on his Iron Horse Sunday back in the day, so you can't forget that. It's got some history to it. And of course, Evil Bikes are still using it with their unique Delta system. So it's really quite popular in the fact that it's uh, got a very good suspension designer behind it, but a lot of people couldn't get past the looks. But this isn't about that. Unfortunately, in order, because of the fact they had to start their own production company to make this fork happen, it's not like designing any other fork. It's a ground up new project made from carbon fiber. It's got Jason Shears from X Envy fame doing all the carbon wizardry on there. They set up a new factory in the Far East, but unfortunately with the lead times and with what's been happening in the world of late with COVID-19, unfortunately they've not been able to source enough parts to keep production going properly. And obviously a lot of production had to close down. And then add to that, problems with investors because of all of this. Everyone's having to save money where they can. Unfortunately, they couldn't secure investment to basically step the company forwards as they really need to. It's a real crucial state. And unfortunately, they've had to just suspend operation. Like I say, heart goes out to you from myself. I'm gutted about it. I very much enjoyed riding your forks. Although I've still not managed to figure out whether I love them or not, but that's not the point. I loved what you were doing and I hope that maybe you'll make a comeback one day. Okay, so now something a little bit different, but not too far away. So how many of us have been guilty about turning our noses up at gravel riding thinking, come on, who really needs, wants, desires a bike like that? I think in mountain bikers, there has been a degree of snobbery. Yours truly is guilty as anyone. But now we're all kind of experiencing some different circumstances nationwide, worldwide, with varying degrees of lockdown. How much do we all just want a bike that is simple, hassle-free, you can just get out the door and have a good time riding pretty much anything. It can turn bridle ways into an engaging experience instead of just blasting down them on your enduro bike. Well, then this next bike, well, it's perfectly, perfectly timed. It is, and I hope I'm gonna say this right, the Fussel. No fuss, less hassle tree is definitely leaning more towards the mountain bike side of things. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's got a longer front center paired to a shorter stem. Ringing any bells? It's also got clearance for tires up to 50 mil in width whilst on their 700C wheels. And if you go 650B, you can fit some proper rubber onto there. It's super cool. 
Also, there's a 31.6 seat post, which, why would you need that? What difference does that make? Well, it means you can fit a wider variety of dropper seat posts to it. So you can see where we're going. Really, really cool looking bike. Check out the launch video. It's certainly ringing true right now. Think about the riding that I actually have available to me and would want to do. So yeah, what do you guys think? Now, this model, the Courseway CR1, was about 24 months in development. It's an aluminium frame fitted to a carbon fork, and that's carbon blades and steerer, which is important. Another element that is really cool, which you're starting to see more of, but I think these guys are taking it to new heights, is customizable spec. So they actually say that even if a part isn't listed on their website, if you get in contact, maybe ask extra nicely, they will do their best to source it for you which I think is super cool. You know, so long have people been buying stuff, knowing they're gonna to have to buy that set of handlebars to then buy another set of handlebars and suddenly you're inundated with, well, handlebars. But I think it's super, super cool. Good on them. I'd be really interested to see the uptake on this and if any other players will follow suit. Just to look at it, you can tell it's intended for something different, similar to when the Polars come out and you could just see something was different going on. You know, they were so slack and so aggressive. Well, I wonder if this will be similar. Get in the comments. What do you guys think? Do you feel the need for a gravel bike now? Maybe you're not able to drive to the trails. I mean, this thing just looks like one hell of a good time. Check out the launch video, which we're also going to include in the description below. Finally, it's time for the quiz. All these years of practicing bingo calls. Well, I think they're finally going to start to pay off. Now we're in the money. Okay, so first question. What does UST stand for and who collaborated to make it? Second question, why are there two mountain bike companies called Fox? And third question, what is this on your screen right now and what the hell does it do? You're gonna have to tune in later on with Doddy to find out the answers. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. You know the drill, this is where I get all nostalgic talking about retro mountain bike gear. If you've got anything retro or you've seen anything retro or perhaps you saw something obscure on Facebook or Instagram and you wanna know what it is and how it's relevant on today's bikes, ask away. Um, you can ask in the comments underneath. Uh, if you've got any images about stuff, let us know. I love telling these stories. Um, well, there you go. So there's a link for you uh, for the uploader service. It's super easy to use. In fact, here's a little bit of a screen flow just to show you just how easy it is to use the uploader service. You click on that link, which is gonna be in the description underneath that video, and you basically fill in your name, you attach the files that are yours, you tell us about what's in them, and that's pretty much it. And you submit it to the relevant section of the show. And then if we love what you sent us, we'll put you on the show next time. So please get involved, we love it. So first up this week, this is a great one. So this is an intense M1, this is from Nicholas in his basement. But I've got to say, mate, you dangled the carrot here and you showed us half a picture. What I've seen, I love, but I would love to see the rest of the pictures. Please take some more and send them in again. Like, please, mate. It's got the Titec Berserker saddle, Control Tech seat post, core stem. It's got, it looks like the Sax grip shift shifters are, I say grip shift, grip shift was patented by SRAM. Um, it's got the Sax Wavies, I think they were called, uh, with Uri grips, you've got HS22s, RockShox Judy DH on there, a whole bunch of other stuff that I can't quite see because they're out of shot, but what you can see looks amazing. And you've also got a steering damper on there. Again, I'd like to see it a bit closer up because there's a few of these, they started becoming popular in the times of the Kamikaze downhill. So you think that was a downhill race, that races would easily get 55, 60 miles an hour, effectively down a black ski piste. But when they started doing it, they were doing it on ridiculous bikes that had the worst geometry for that sort of riding, really steep angles. And to avoid the sort of tank slap you'd get at that speed, they started using steering dampers, which actually came from the motorbike world. Uh, some of them quite interesting, some were hydraulic. That one looks like a shim stack style one. Uh, um, in fact, you can get a steering damper headset from Cane Creek. And essentially, it puts just slight resistance on the bearing, so it just steers slightly slower. At low speed, it feels a bit weird, but high speed, absolutely brilliant. Really cool. Please, uh, Nicholas, send in some more pictures. You've been teasing me with that. I'd love to see some more. Next up is a Bianchi. This is from Eric in Seattle. Uh, hi Doddy, with the quarantine in place and all the bike projects done for a moment, I've had plenty of time to send you pics of my favorite vintage bikes. This Bianchi is pretty rare. Uh, not a light speed build frame. 
Um, original Italian build with a 6.4 tied down tube uh, with internal spars to reduce vibration and add stiffness. It's made from a folded sheet of titanium welded at the bottom. Frame was fully painted until I had a crack repaired on the BB. Oh, okay, that's nice. Well, you've done a good job of that. So I stripped and brushed the frame after it was fixed and it looks like you've masked it down there. Parts wise, it's a bit of a mashup. This was a recipient of all the cool parts I could find with no real plan. Marzocchi Z2 to match the Italian frame. Beautiful old fork, that. With those open oil baths on there, yeah. Uh, they last forever and easily serviced if needed. To be honest, most people never even bothered servicing them. In fact, I would love to take apart an original pair. Now, if anyone's got any out there they want to donate just for a video, I would love to use them just so I could take them apart and just see. We'll do a show and tell with the fork. Um, it would be super cool. Z1, Z2s, whatever. Anything from that era. Uh, White Brothers, Titanium Riser Bar, Moot, Thai Stem, Cane Creek, Threadless Stem, Vintage Pools Love Levers. Oh, super nice, dude. Look at this stuff. Critical Racing Cantilevers. Man, they were rare as well. Love those things. Uh, Race Face Next LP Square Taper Cranks, Mavic 717 Snowflake Lace. Oh, I used to love the look of Snowflake. Working in the bike shop in that era, I remember when someone came in to uh, order a snowflake wheel. Everyone would just make himself scarce because you just didn't want to have to lace the thing up. Massive pain in the arse they were. Uh, the bike is set up as my pavement pounder. Absolute blast to ride. The S-Band seat stays really do take the edge off. I tell you what, mate, it's absolutely lovely. And it's great that you're still riding the thing. Hasn't titanium got such a nice ride quality to it? I'm convinced that titanium of all the metals and all the sort of thermoplastics and carbons out there, that is the one to have if you're going to have, have a hardtail frame. Such a beautiful metal. Yeah, lovely. Really, really nice looking thing. Oh, look at these shots. So good to see, mate. Martini racing graphic on the top tube. So Italian, I love it. Is that a titanium bell as well? It looks a bit homemade. It's very cool if it is. Nice, thank you for sending that in. Okay, next up is from Rob in Utah, and this is a 1980s Richie Ascent. This is my third COVID isolation restoration. Whoa, you've been not hanging around. I fully restored and slightly updated it with pulls, components, brakes, one by eight thummy, pull stroke micro shift shifter, and some other vintage used and new old stock cast NOS Richie bits. Paint was done at home using spray bike paint. Wicked, dude. There you go, there's a height right on it. The first ever dropper post right there on screen. Bizarre things they are, but so cool. The Ritchie WCS um, SPDs, they use the same cleat design as Shimano as well. So if you ever use up the cleats, you use Shimano's on those. Ritchie Logic cranks, pulls, components, levers. Oh, look at the cantilevers. Wow, they are beautiful. I prefer it if you had your, your straddle holster the other way around, but I uh, can't have everything, can we? Um, Ritchie rear as well there. Okay, next up's from from uh, Barney in Toronto, Canada. I bought the frame in 2016, so I always wanted one. And I built this up with XT 3x10, so it's a 2000 light speed Pisca. Pisca? Pisca? I don't know how you say it. Um, beautiful, all the same. Light speed frames, man. What a great name as well as a bike brand. Really cool to see this. Oh, built up with a 2001 SID uh, to complete the Millennium thing. What a lovely looking fork as well. Uh, really nice to see you've built that period. Oh, so many great old school retro bikes in there. Uh, keep them coming, people. We love this stuff. Now it is time for top mods, which at the moment is something of a treasure trove. So much good stuff. Sadly, we can't feature them all on the show, but honestly, they brighten up mine and Dottie's day. We get to scan through them, have a look, see what you guys get up to. So keep uploading them. Get in the upload link below. Honestly, even if we don't feature it, we really do appreciate you taking the time to do it. And we absolutely love them. So, onwards. The first one, and this is something of a, you know, a double header. It's from Andy, and he's from Austin in Texas. And he explains that his wife built him this awesome bike stand for $7. And it works great for a rear brake bleed. So obviously this is a pretty comprehensive um, way to hang your bike. The tires aren't on the wall, it's staying nice and clean. You can see that incredibly long wheelbase of that Nuke Proof Mega, which is actually the one Doddy used to have when it's testing the limits of that bit of board, but it's on there and it looks really, really clean, very functional. But this is where it gets really good. Putting a bleed bucket up there. What you want to do ideally when bleeding a brake is be pushing the oil up through the system and as the oil goes up it will be pushing and flushing the air out which is exactly what you want so using gravity to your advantage 
will not only make your bleeds better, but also easier. So, win-win. This one's really, really cool. I've never done it to such an extent before, but yeah, I think that's pretty good indeed. And he said it cost him a mere $7. Say no more. Perfect. Super, super cool. The next submission is from Brett, another American. Brett is from California. And this is his 2019 Cotic Soul Mercury. And I'm gonna call it here. I don't think we've ever seen such a decked out hardtail on the show. I mean, look at it. We've got SRAM XS, including the dropper. We've got those work of art, titanium cranks. I mean, those, those are, those are worth a pretty Brittany. We've got a Chris King headset. We've got, is it We Are One rims? I mean, the thing is just jewel worthy. Is that, oh yeah, a Fox 34 step cast, which is a beautiful, beautiful fork. And some Onyx hubs. Now, I'll often have a little bit of a joke and a play saying about my aversion, you know, to, uh, what's it called? The old petrol finish, you know what I mean? But I'll tell you what, that, that's making a believer out of me. I feel some humble pie coming my way. Yeah, Shimano XTR full pop brakes, I'm in. It's one hell of a machine, eh? I don't think, thinking about it, I think that is not decked as we've ever had. I think that's about as decked as you can make it. Wow, no, that is honestly staggering. I would love a bike like that. It comes to, I suppose, what we we're talking about earlier on, when we we're talking about getting out your front door and just riding whatever's in front of you. Here in the southwest of the UK, we have some really good bridle paths, but in some places, we're not overwhelmed by, you know, super techy or amazing trail riding. But you ride a hardtail, you ride a gravel bike, suddenly it livens things up a bit. It keeps you on your toes and makes the experience a tad more engaging. What do you guys think? How many of you are still on hardtails and how many of you are on full sus? Who of you owns both? I mean, is it like your children? Do you love them all equally? I don't know, I'm a full sus kind of guy. I haven't had a hardtail in years, but I think something's got to change kind of soon because honestly, I think ripping around locally on a hardtail would be absolutely fantastic. Now guys, if you've got some great submissions yourselves, don't forget, get them in the upload link below. Okay, now it's time for some quiz answers. Now at the beginning of the show, Henry asked you three tech questions. Did you get them right? Did you, really? All right, so here are the answers. Uh, the first question, he asked, what does UST stand for and what companies helped produce it? So it stands for Universal System Tubeless. Now it was Mavic that actually started uh, UST system off, but they did it in conjunction with Michelin and Hutchinson. There's a few images on screen of a video I made actually all about the history of Mavic. The link to that video is gonna be in the description underneath this. If you've not seen it, have a watch. It's really quite a cool video. I'll tell you a little bit of history all about the brand and some of the amazing things they've done, as well as having a look at some of their products. But this is mainly old school focus, so it's really quite relevant for this show. Now, anyway, one of the cool things about the UST system was they wanted to have a tubeless system for bikes. And Mavic being the wheel manufacturer, they were like, right, we're gonna come up with a rim design, we've got this. So by having a rim design where the spokes don't actually penetrate through the rim, they sealed the rim bed off. So straight away, you could see where they were going with this. They made the hook system, not hookless system, that came later. Uh, basically it was like a revamped hook, it had slightly more edge to it to really hold onto the bead of the tires. And they also developed the tubeless valve as well, obviously to set it up. Now to get around the fact that they basically couldn't use the traditional system where a nipple would sit into the rim and a spoke would penetrate it, they developed these, well I'd say they're quite intricate sort of uh, nipples that screw into the actual rim itself, along with their own Zycraft spokes. So this was exclusive to Mavic in those early days. No one else could do this. So they licensed that technology. Now to make it though, they needed tire manufacturers to come on board. So they had the expertise of French brands, Michelin and Hutchinson working with them to develop that UST system. Now in the early days, you had to license the UST technology in order to have tubeless, but these days we know it is tubeless ready. It's slightly different and a lot more companies are offering that and similar things, but really, UST came from Mavic. It was the best and I still think it's the best, but 
Very cool. Okay, the next question was, why are there two mountain bike companies using the name Fox? Did you get it? Okay, so the clue here is the fact that one of those companies uses the tail in their logo, this is their logo, and the other one uses the head. Now, it's basically is a family story. So his brothers, Bob and Jeff Fox. Uh, Bob Fox now is famous for being behind the Fox Racing Shocks, that's the Fox tail, and Jeff Fox is behind the Fox Head logo, which is the clothing and protection. They were one company originally and decided to split and specialize in their respective fields. I think it was in uh, 1977, yeah, Bob Fox separated apart to pursue the Fox Racing Shocks. But essentially, they were one company and sharing the same name at different ends of the spectrum. Quite cool, I think. And the last question was, what is this for? Okay, so this is a little UV light, and it comes with some muck-off lubricants. Uh, not all of them, only the ones that have got UV tracer on the inside. Now, why on earth would you wanna have UV tracer inside a chain lube? It's not like you can ride a bike for a nightclub, is it? No, that's not what it's for. It's kind of quite cool, actually, and it is definitely for like the nerdier bike mechanics and stuff out there. If you want the optimum amount of chain lube on your bike, you can inspect how much has gone onto your chain links by using the UV light or the black light on there. I think it's quite cool. And this is the effect you get. Here's a bit of chain, um, just shining the UV light over it that's not been lubricated. I mean, admittedly, you might see some color on there because it has been lubricated a few days back. Now here's a bit with some fresh lube on it. And look at the difference. You can see it shining out. So if you basically want to put the ultimate amount of chain lube, perfectionists only need to apply here. This is quite cool and it works really well. And um, rumor has it, you could also use these to make sure the room in a hotel that you're booking is, um, is clean. But I don't know what people mean by that. And that is it for another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Thank you very much for watching. I hope everyone's staying safe and making the most of these really difficult times by tinkering away on their bikes. As always guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit us up on Instagram with all your latest tech as well as our uploader. And we'll see you next time. Cheers.